Well, good morning, everybody. If you don't know me, if it's if you're new or your first time, my name is Scott Broom. I'm the uh, men's director and the media director here at the church. And every Sunday night, or almost every Sunday night, we go have dinner at my parents' house. So me, my wife, and our football team of children will go uh, hang out with my mom and dad, and then usually my brother, his wife, and their one very well-dressed child will show up, <laughs> while mine looked like they just got shot out of a cannon, will y'all show up? Um, so I have four boys, uh, six and under. The two youngest ones are twins, so my house is always a good time. Last night, I was um, putting the scriptures in for our online audience at the house, and I was making them, and I just hear this blood-curdling scream. Turns out one of my sons was putting a water bottle on the counter. It fell off, hit one of the twins in the head really hard, and then knocked him back and hit his head on the ground. So he was screaming. had a huge knot. I was like, it's like one of those times you're like, you want to be mad at somebody, but it was just an accident, so you can't be. But anyway, every Sunday, we go over to mom and dad's. And uh, last Sunday, Andrew, my brother, asked me, he's like, do you think uh, the new sanctuary will feel different or about the same as preaching in the old one? Well, I can confirm it feels different. <laughs> this is, I was like, the old one felt like the way uh, Pastor John put it, or j Dog as I call him. He was like, the old building kind of felt like you were just in your house with your friends. This feels different. But nonetheless, I'm glad you're here. We're starting a new series today called Divine Design and God's Blueprint for a Better Life. I want to start by talking actually about the old building. So back in 2020, we had a company called SES come in and install all of the stuff that we needed to run an actual live broadcast uh, because we didn't know how to do that and still don't know how to do that. And so they came in and they set everything up for us, and that was at the end of 2020. But throughout the past few years, we've wanted to do different things that they didn't necessarily set us up for. And so it was kind of us just sitting around um, me or Kendrick or TK, mainly Kendrick, sat around and figured out, okay, we need to do X, Y, or Z, and we don't really know how to do it, so let's just try to figure out the way that makes sense to us. And the same thing with me on the computers on how to play videos, how to put graphics up and all this stuff. I didn't know what you were supposed to do. I just like sat there and thought about it. I'm like, we can make it this way, and I think this will work. And then we would have to rig stuff. There's so many wires in the old building that just run through the ceiling. I mean, just miles and miles of wires. Um, because we just kind of ghetto rigged everything throughout the years as we were going on. It's like, we're not going to look to how this looks in the future. We just need to solve this problem now. And it was like, when the guys came in from SES to, to pull all of the stuff out of the old building and move it into this building, they were asking us kind of, it's just embarrassing. They were asking us how we did things. And I was like, well, we have this and this routes to this. And then we queue these at different times. And this runs on this computer and this runs on this computer. And he just kind of like looked at me. Because there are two guys, Anthony and then Josh. Anthony's a real big jokester. And so he just told, he told everybody they need to find somebody else new to run media. But then... Josh, who was a little more serious at first, I ended up wearing him down over the course of a few weeks of him being here. We finally got to joke together. But Josh was more serious. And he, just, he was like, yeah, that's not the way most people would do that. <laughs> and then as he called me time after time during the install of this building, I'd be like, he'd be like, do you want this or this? And I'd be like, well, I don't really know what either of those things are. So whatever way you think is best would be the way I'll take it. But I say that to say that especially in the old building, we had put stuff together in a way that worked somewhat, but it was dreadfully suboptimal at best. And half the time when stuff went wrong, our, our go-to to fix it was, have you restarted it? I, if, if, if that doesn't work, I don't know what to tell you today. If you have a, if we, got a, we got one option. You can reboot it. If that doesn't work, then we have no hope. And so things worked. We found a way for things to work, but it was suboptimal at best. And I feel like oftentimes, to a degree, that's our Christian life, that we've gotten saved, we put our faith in Christ, but it, we live a suboptimal Christian life because we're really not using what God's given us the way God intended. And we're not really living in such a way that God intended for us to live. And the people that miss out at the end of the day is you and me. And so the heart of this series 
is really looking at God's design for how we should live our lives, which is oftentimes a lot different than how we actually live our lives. And the tagline up there, God's blueprint for a better life, I want you to understand that a better life is not predicated on your external circumstances. You can have a lot of stuff happen to you externally that's better, but because internally you haven't been changed, your overall level of joy and happiness doesn't really increase. It's not more satisfying. They've actually done a lot of studies that your dopamine, which is basically like feel good, it's like what you would get when you're scrolling social media and you get that hit of dopamine, those types, or you get a new house or you get a new car, you level up in your career, that hit of like, oh, this is amazing, your baseline level of dopamine, and actually after that spike, it goes back to baseline pretty quickly. And so even though you have the new house or you have the new car, you got the promotion and it's sweet for a little while, the base level of happiness or joy that you experience, it goes back to that normal. You just have a new normal and the new thing that was really great is now just your new standard of living. And so when we talk about God's blueprint for a better life, it's not necessarily material blessing it is that on the inside, you become changed in such a way that you actually have a better life. You actually live a better life, not because your external circumstances are necessarily better, but because inwardly you've been renewed to where you actually enjoy your life more. And so one of the ways this shows up is in the idea of God's provision or God providing for us. And I think, don't worry about that. <laughs> I think that um, we oftentimes think that provision is all upon our shoulders, especially for the dads or the husbands in the room that feel like all the weight is on me to be the provider. Or maybe you're a single mom in the room and all the weight you feel like is on you to be the provider. And you feel like if I don't go out and get up early and work and strive, and do all these things, then I won't be provided for. And it's this feeling of like it's all on you. And I want to share with you how that's really not the truth. Because God has a better way, and in fact, God's way is always the best way. Like whatever way we choose that is not God's way is a worse way of doing something. God's way is always the best way to do something, even if it doesn't feel like it at the time. And so I want to go to Matthew 6, starting in verse 25. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Example number one, he says, Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today alive, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And so Jesus, through a few different examples, basically tells you not to worry. He says, if you seek me, if you seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all the things that you're worried about, he says, I'll take care of. And I think our mantra for life oftentimes is, once I take care 
of the physical needs in my life. If I have time, I'll spend time with God. If I have time, I'll seek him. But God, you don't understand. I have to be up. I have to be at work early. I have to provide for my family. And so you're like, God, I don't have, I don't have time for you. I mean, how many, how many times have you heard believers, maybe yourself, say, oh, I, just, I really need to make time for the Bible. I really need to make time for prayer. But I, I'm just so busy right now. I just have so much going on. Work's just nonstop. I'm working from the time I get up to the time I go to bed. I don't, I don't have time right now. And our mantra oftentimes is just that, that I need to take care of my physical needs first, and then if I have time, I'll take care of this spiritual need of seeking God. Whereas God's mantra is that he says, if you seek me, if you really go after me, he says, I'll provide everything that you need. He just says, I'll add it all to you. I'll add it all to you. And I believe one of the main reasons that God says this is because he wants to spend time with you. And he wants to spend time with me. Like he's not saying it, I believe, out of a mechanism of fussing at you as much as he's like, you you don't understand. I actually want to spend time with you. I want you to get to know me so much so that if you start to seek me, I'll make sure that your needs are taken care of because of how much I want to spend time with you and how much I want you to get to know me. And I believe we're wired this way of waking up feeling like it's all on our shoulders because prior to Christ, this essentially was our reality, and God knows that. He knows that prior to him, Like this type of relationship where he says, seek me first, seek your heavenly father, that we put our faith in him, that we're a believer now, that we have a heavenly father who will provide for us. That maybe growing up before you put your faith in Christ, this feeling of being an orphan and like it was all on your shoulders, he knows that's deeply ingrained in you. And I'm not saying that prior to Christ, God never took care of you. We know the scripture says that he's kind to both the unjust and the cruel or the wicked. There's a general level, I believe, of mercy that God has on all of his creation. And you can see that just by looking around and seeing that wicked people live a long time. And God gives them chance after chance after chance to repent. And so I'm not saying that God never takes care of anybody who's not in his family. But this specific type of go to your heavenly father and seek him and he'll provide all you need. He's saying that as a, as a believer, as a child of God, he's saying, if you seek me, I'll make sure everything you need is taken care of. And I want to tell you a story, a hypothetical story. Let's say you have a kid who's relatively young, who grew up in a home that did not take care of him at all. Each and every day, his parents were basically absent. Each and every day, he woke up. He had to make sure he had food for himself. He had to make sure he had clothes. Nobody took care of him. And so every day, he woke up, and he's like, it's all on my shoulders. It's all on my shoulders. If I don't go out today, there's there's nobody to take care of me. It's all on my shoulders to go get what I need to eat. It's all on my shoulders to go get the clothes I need. It's all on my shoulders to go get water to drink. And my parents don't provide for me at all. And so that's what he lives with as an early child, that if I don't, if I don't go out and work, then I don't eat. If I don't go out and work, then I don't get clothing. If I don't go out and work, then I don't get water. I don't go out and work. I don't get the things that I need to live. But then he's put up for adoption, and he's adopted by a family that's loving and caring and genuinely wants the best for him. And so every day he wakes up in this new family that loves him, and his dad's sitting there in the living room, and he goes, I, I got I to gotta go work. I, got, I, I, won't, I won't survive if I don't go work today. If I don't go work, I won't have clothing and I won't have food. And the dad's like, that's that's not true anymore. 
Like, I'll take care of you. And the son's like, no, I got to go. I got to go. And he rushes out the door. And he provides for himself. And to a degree, it works. He's able to find enough work to get some clothes. They're hand-me-downs. They're second-hand. He's able to find a little bit of food. He's able to survive. But every day, his dad's like, you, you don't have to go do that anymore. Like, I'll, I'll provide for you. If you spend time with me, I'll provide for you. I'll make sure you have what you need. I'll talk to the guy down the road who I know is really good, and I'll line up a good job for you. Or at the end of the day, we'll cook for you. You don't have to go find food yourself. And I feel like oftentimes, this is you and me. We feel like spiritual orphans. And we feel like if we don't go out and work and take care of it ourselves, that God's really not a good father that will provide for us. Whereas what God wants is to spend time with us and for us to get to know him because just like that kid that goes out every day and feels like he has to provide for himself, what the good dad knows he needs and what our heavenly father knows we need is to be healed from the wounds that make us go do that to begin with. And he knows that time with him, spending time in his love and in his presence, and then witnessing him provide for us will be the thing that our soul needs to heal us. And so by going out and working every day, feeling like we're spiritual orphans, we may feel like it works because we have some level of physical provision from our labor. But what we miss out on most is the spiritual development and really having a heavenly father. We miss out on the reality of the relationship that we really have with Christ. And so God wants to genuinely spend time with you. Because he understands something that I believe you and I miss so often, which is that our spiritual poverty is way worse than our physical poverty. That our spiritual need is far more significant than our physical need. Our spiritual need is far more significant than our spiritual need. I mean, our physical need, excuse me. And so, one of the really just cool things about God is how this really starts to play out when you really start to seek him. When you really start to say, I'm going to trust you just enough to start to chase after you and really believe that you'll actually provide for me. Because when we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, God will use two main things to begin to transform us. One is time spent in his presence. When you wake up in the morning and you set aside time truly to get in the word and to pray and just to maybe sit there silent for a little bit and say, God, I'm here. I just, I want to, I want to put you first. I believe you enough to know that I need you. One, you get to experience his presence right there in your quiet time. Maybe you get to experience him speaking to you through scripture or through a devotional. And just time in his presence, I promise you, changes you. Just time in his presence will deeply change you. I can attest to that from going in quiet time frustrated or upset or irritated, and by the end of it, weeping for people I wanted to punch when I went into quiet time. It's not 100% of the time, just for clarity. You may try it tomorrow, and it may not work like that. And it doesn't always work like that 100% of the time for me, but if I go back enough and I chase God... He meets me in such a way that my heart's changed, like my heart's genuinely changed. And so one, you're changed just by sitting in his presence. But two, when you begin to seek God first, and then you see him add everything to you, you see him provide your physical need, you then get to see God use that physical need being met to increase your faith in the fact that he's actually trustworthy. So when you go out yourself and you work and you grind and you get something for your effort, you reinforce the idea that if I don't do it, nobody will take care of me. But when you go to God first and you lay out everything before him, your wants, your needs, your desires, your worries, your anxieties, God, I have this issue. I have this thing going on at work. Lord, I don't know how I'm going to pay bills this month or I don't know how I'm going to reconcile this family issue we have going on, 
and you begin to bring it before him, there's something that it does just to do that. But then as you do that and you start to seek him first and trust him, and then he starts to work in that physical need and meet that physical need, now you have a faith built on the fact that he met a physical need that builds you up spiritually. So when you forsake the spiritual part and just go after the physical, your physical need is probably met, but you're spiritually, you're left in poverty. Whereas when you chase God first, you're built up spiritually, you're provided for physically, and God will use that physical provision to build you up spiritually. So you get what you originally needed plus what you actually need the most, which is to be out of spiritual poverty and to know that you have a heavenly father who you can actually trust and go to. And so God wants you to seek him, learn to actually trust him, learn to get to know him because he knows that we all are dreadfully broken. We were born into sin. We were born in a sinful world. And he knows the thing you and I need most is him. And so he says, if you seek me, he says, because in this scripture, he says, I know that you need all of these other things. When he talks about clothing, food, and water, it literally says your heavenly father knows you need them. God knows your physical needs are important, but he knows there's a need that's more important, which is your spirituality and your spiritual life. And so he says, if you seek me, then I'll begin to work and change you from the inside, and I'll also take care of all the other stuff so that you don't have to wake up each and every day frantically running through your mind of, I got these 15 things to do, and if I don't get them done, then this won't happen, blah, 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 blah. You can, you can stop and say, I'm going to get up, and the first thing I want to do is chase God. And I'll just trust that somehow, in this seemingly impossible situation, God has the ability to work it out. Like if, if God is real, and the Bible is true, and the God of the universe spoke everything into existence, like you just look out into the world and he just, he just spoke it and it's all there. Then if we, if we really believe that on not just an intellectual level, but a heart level, we'd probably be like, you know what? God could pay my mortgage if he wanted to for a month. Or he could work out this family situation. Like that's probably not too hard for him if he just spoke and the universe was created. But we have this deep felt uncertainty that even if he's real and even if he's all powerful, that he's not good. And that he may care about the person next to you. He may work in people's lives that are around you, but for whatever reason, you feel like he won't work in yours. Maybe he's the provider for other people, but you feel like he's not the provider for you. And so God will use meeting your physical needs when you go to him and trust him with it. He'll work it out in such a way that you start to have a track record behind you of God's faithfulness. And that's something that nobody can take away from you. To have gone to God about a certain situation and prayed and sought the face of God and for God to work that out in whichever way he chooses to be fit, for you to have the evidence that I went and I prayed and by what just happened in my life in the physical world, I have undeniable evidence that the God of the universe heard me. There's no amount of money in the world that can buy that. Jeff Bezos cannot buy the fact that God is real and God's provided. No amount of money in the world can buy that type of assurance. And it's exactly what your soul and my soul need. You know, the Israelites, when they were in the desert, they saw God work in really, really powerful ways. Like if you're led by a pillar of fire, that's pretty wild, right? But they constantly thought that, oh, God just brought us out here to kill us. They believed that God was powerful. They just really didn't trust in his goodness. But God's good, and he genuinely wants to take care of you, and he knows all the needs you have. And he says, please come to me and seek me, and I'll, I'll make sure those other things are taken care of. I believe probably, too, he'll still line up things that you'll be spiritually taken care of just because you're his kid, but you'll miss out on the spiritual reward of really sitting with him and watching him work in the midst of what you prayed for. And I want to share a few stories of how I've actually seen this play out. 
But first, I want you to know a couple things. One, God isn't math, and we can't deduce him just to inputs and outputs. And I'll explain what I mean. Sometimes we look at God almost as like a formula or a genie in a bottle that if I input this behavior, I get this outcome. And in a general level, that is true. For instance, obedience will equal some type of blessing. You obey God and what he's calling you to do. There will be some type of blessing for that. Maybe it's material, maybe it's not. The greatest blessing he could give you is just himself and his presence. That being said, God's a being. He's not math. Like he became flesh and dwelt among us. Like God inhabited Jesus and was a person. And so we don't want to deduce God to, okay, I'm in this situation, and so if I just do this thing, then I get, it's like a slot machine. If I do this thing, then I get this thing. It's not that. And then the other thing is to operate differently in different types of circumstances does not mean one's fundamental character has inherently changed. Because we often hear the scripture quoted that, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, that he can't change. That's true. But just because God's fundamental character hasn't ever changed doesn't mean he won't operate differently in different circumstances in different people's lives. And so where this thought process of God's never changed would break down is if you see God providing for somebody else's life in a specific way, and you think that has to be the way God will provide for you. It doesn't. God's very, very individualistic, and he'll walk you through the circumstance in the way exactly for what you need. And so God may operate very differently, even in the stories I'll share in a minute. God's not changed, but the way God moves can function differently based on your life, based on where you are, based on what you need. Because when God works in such a way that your physical needs are provided for too, He's doing it not just for that, but he's doing that in such a way that your faith will be built in him. And he knows things that you're going through, things that you struggle with, and specific ways of working in your situation that will be the thing that your soul needs the most. And then finally, to trail off that thought, these stories aren't meant to display all mechanisms of provision, but rather to build your faith in the one who provides. Meaning, if you try to only think that these few stories, well, that, those are the way God provides, and that's the way I'm going to look for this. I don't know how God wants to provide for you in your situation and what you're going through, but God does. And these stories aren't to encompass all the ways that God provides for people, but it's to give you an example and to build your faith that God does actually provide. And so I want to share... One story from my childhood first. I believe I've told this in men's ministry at least once. So growing up, um, I didn't really know a whole lot at the time, but we ain't got no money. We didn't have any. All right? Um, We used to do, sometimes we would have pizza, but it was really, it was either one, it was the $1.99 frozen pizzas from Aldi's back in the day. It's probably like $8 now, but it was $1.99 back in the day. It was probably plastic. Who knows what we actually ate? But uh, I'm sure my wife would not let us eat that now because I'm sure it has unhealthy stuff in it. It was either that or sometimes I would take a piece of toast and then just put tomato sauce and cheese on it and put it in the toaster oven and pretend it was pizza. We had a good childhood. We just didn't know we ain't got no money. So... Growing up, we were homeschooled, my older brother, me, and my sister. Um, We went to a private school for half a year in fifth grade and then found out I liked homeschooling way better and immediately went back home. Um, But I did go to college, and I did well, so you can can be homeschooled and not be a complete idiot. (laughs) But when we got to high school, um, mom was basically like, hey, I don't understand this math thing once you get to, like, algebra. So she bought us videos that explained it all, basically. I mean, my brother were okay at math. My sister was not. She was not good at all. But 
we had to get these tapes for my brother, so he would have been 14 at the time, going into high school, and they were about $300 for these, and we didn't have it. And so mom was basically like, Lord, you know that we need these. We don't have the $300 for these math. It was tapes back. It wasn't even DVDs. It was tapes back in the day. And so she prayed, and if I'm not mistaken, it was that day. So she prayed, Lord, I, I know we need these things, but we don't have the money for it. Will you provide? She got up and just sought God. She didn't go up and say, hey, I need to go out and it's 5 a.m. I need to go find some place to work and make some money. She said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seek God. I'm going to believe that he's good and that he'll provide what we need. And I'm not lying. That day in the mail, she received exactly $300 from my aunt who didn't know about the situation and just randomly was like, we we're going to send you $300. Didn't know about it, but she woke up and sought God for the exact amount of money she needed to buy the math tapes. The money came in the mail that day. And I don't know about you, but I don't usually just get random checks or cash for $300 in the mail. I mean, I'd, amen, I'd take it. But that's usually not the way it works. But she said, I'm going to seek God. I'm going to trust that he's a good father. And he knows that we need these. Like, you could have some grumpy, cynical, stingy Christian say, well, it'll be a believer. You don't really need math, you know. But God knew it was something that we needed. And he said, I want to show you who I am. I want to show you who I am. And that, like, that's nothing to God. But for us, it might as well have been $3,000. But he said, I'll provide for you. I'll provide for you. And that built up her faith. It built up our faith. Stuff like that happened often enough when I was growing up that we as little children started being annoyed that mom was still shocked that God provided for us because we're like, if he really is who you say he is, why wouldn't he provide? But she sought God and he delivered exactly what we needed right when we needed it in the mail. And you can't make that up. Another one, and the band can go ahead and join me. Another one is actually a story from me about, I want to say six years ago or so, maybe seven. So my degree is in exercise science, and then I, I helped run a gym for years before I ever came here. Um, and so that's where my formal education is. But that last year I worked at the gym, and then when I came here, at the gym I did a lot of 1099 work. And if you don't know what that is, it's basically you get paid, but they don't take any taxes out, which means the taxes are on you to pay. Well, there's this thing called quarterly taxes, and I didn't do any of it. And then it came to the end of the year, and I started thinking, you know, we don't have very much money, and I feel like based on the amount of money I made 1099, I'm probably, I'm probably going to owe some money in taxes. And I remember that being probably December or January. You know, you, you got something coming up, and you're kind of like, it's not quite here yet. I can kick that can down the road a little bit longer. I don't have to immediately worry about it, but it's just kind of in the back of your mind, like, this is going to be a problem at some point. And I was like, I just remember thinking, Lord, like, I may have not been the wisest, and I'm sorry, but will you help me? Please. And if you're like me, you wait till the very last minute to do your taxes. Um, that year it was on TurboTax, which if you don't know anything about taxes, I would not recommend doing them yourselves because I, I think I messed up. Um, probably owed more money than I should have. I told somebody about it. They're like, you should not have paid that much money. I'm like, well, I did. I mean, it's gone now. The government has it. I'm not getting it back. So now I pay somebody to do my taxes. And, and I still turn it in late enough. I'm like, hey, here it is. You're probably going to have to file an extension. I'm sorry. But they're very nice about it. Either way, there's some people that like January 1st, you do your taxes. And then there's other people like me, you wait till the last minute. I've tried each year. Each year, I'm like, I'm going to do them by February. And then like the end of March rolls around. I'm like, yeah, here we are again. So I knew this was coming up. And it was kind of on the back of my mind. And I was like, if it's kind of what I think it might be, I was like, I don't, like, I don't know what we'll do. Um, I was like, can you put taxes on a credit card? I don't know. <laughs> um, 
And so I knew taxes were coming up and this was probably, it was right after we left the gym, me and my wife and I came here. And one of the ladies from the gym asked Rachel, who was also a coach, um, she said, hey, will, will you come help me shop for groceries once a week and then that same night, will you help me cook and just prepare for these meals? Because the lady was trying to get her nutrition in order. She said, if you come and you shop with me, we're just going to go to Publix, you tell me what I need to get, and then you come home for the next like hour and a half, cook with me on Monday nights, just that, once a week, I'll give you $200 a week. And I was like, yes, you, you can do that. And so she got to shop with this lady and help her cook dinner for about three hours and made $200 a week doing it. And that started somewhere between December and January. And she was pregnant with our first son, Gaines, at the time. And it went up till right after tax season. But the amount of money that she made from helping this lady prepare meals and help her cook was almost exactly the amount of money that we owed in taxes. And then right after that, for the last month of pregnancy, Rachel's like, hey, I don't, I don't want to do it right now, but I think she said we can pick it up later. To this day, she's never had that job again. They never followed back up. It was this one four to six month block where God said, I know they're going to need that money and I'll provide for them. And the thing about God is sometimes he drops money in the mail, which would be sweet if that's always the way it happened. Sometimes God gives you a job. Sometimes God just lines things up to where you meet somebody that you've been looking for a babysitter for months and then all of a sudden they're right there because you've been praying for one. Like God knows exactly what you need and he knows the way that he wants to give it to you. You know, we would all maybe like just for provision to be dropped in the mail all the time. And sometimes it happens like that. But sometimes God provision is somebody comes to you and says, hey, will you do this job? There were many times growing up where we needed money and mom, she's been all kinds of things. She made pottery for a while. She worked at a vet's office. And those were things God lined up. He didn't always provide money in the mail. Sometimes it was. But a lot of times it looked like her praying and saying, Lord, you know, we need this. How do you, how do you want to work this out, Father? I'm here. Whatever you want to do, I'll do it. And then somebody would come to her and say, hey, I got this job opening. Will you do this? And so her faith was built. My faith was built through the fact that I sought God and then God met that physical need in such a way that I knew the God of the universe heard me. And there's nothing in life that can ever steal the trail of evidence that I have in my life that God's faithful. It doesn't mean that I don't wake up and ever doubt that God will do it again. It doesn't mean I don't. I've woken up some mornings and been like, God, is all, are you even real? Is all this just a sham? Am I delusional? I've had mornings like that. Like not like before I got saved, like in the past year. But the thing I have is not, I don't know. The thing I have is a mountain of evidence behind me from my mom's life and from my own life and the people around me. Undeniably, God's real. I have a mountain of evidence that helps me deal with doubt. Because time after time again, I've seen it from my mom in my own life, the people around me, we've trusted God and he's provided. We've trusted God and he's answered prayers. Maybe not in the way we thought or the way that we wanted, but in a way that we know he's faithful. In a way that when I start to look ahead and start to have doubts about the future or anything else, I, I can look back and be like, no, he's like, his word's true. He's not a liar. And he's always provided for me. Always provided for me. There's a scripture in Psalms where David says, I was once young and now I'm old, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. God will take care of you. And so you don't have to wake up feeling like a spiritual orphan because if you put your faith in Christ, you're not one. And it's not just God commanding you, yeah, you need to do this. He's saying, no, I know that you're broken and the thing you need is me. And if you come to me, 
because I want you so much, I'll make sure your physical needs are met. And in fact, I'll use them in such a way that you can look back and trust me even more. Because what God is constantly undoing in our lives is this idea that he's not good. No matter how, how many times we see that he's faithful, no matter how many times that we see he's come through, time and time again, we doubt and say he was good then, but is he good now? He provided for me then, but will he provide for me now? And I don't know. But the more that we can seek the face of God, seek his kingdom and seek, seek his righteousness, maybe for you it's not physical provision for your family, you're well off, that's fine. Maybe it's something for your business or maybe it's you have this one track you can go in your business that's kind of unethical, but it would make you a lot of money. It says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, choosing the right way to do things. You can say, that might make me a lot of money, but I'm not gonna do that because it would not honor the God that I serve. And so I'll lay that down and I'll trust God that you'll provide what we need. I'll, I'll renounce underhanded tactics. And I wanna share one more and then I'll be done. This is actually a story that my wife told me just this week um, that I just thought was cool to share. There's a young guy in our church who's in student ministry um, who really enjoys this specific sport. And he got offered the chance to go on a travel team. But what it would mean to go on this travel team with that he would miss Wednesday nights in student ministry. And so him and his buddy, who also go, I assume, although they really wanted, to, it's like a big honor. I never played traditional sports, so I don't know what that's like, but I skateboarded. But it's a big honor, but it would have meant that he missed Wednesday night youth, student ministry. And so him and his buddy went to the coach and said, hey, we would love to be able to do this travel league, but because it interferes with Wednesday night, I'm sorry, we can't do it. And within a day or two, the coach was so moved by them standing up for what they believed in that he changed the practice to Thursdays so that they got to do it. And I think it's easy to sometimes to be overly cynical and think, well, God doesn't care about the sports or he doesn't care about, like he cares about, you know, these other more weighty matters. But God honored them standing up for the fact that they didn't want to miss Wednesday night and what they believed it was doing in their lives and in their soul. And he said, because you stood up, I'll give you that too. God's far more gentle than we imagine him to be. And I think he far more wants us to enjoy this life than we think he really does. And so what I want you to leave today with is the reality that you can actually trust God and with whatever you're, whatever's going on in your life right now, if you seek him, that he'll provide what you need. But listen to me, just listening to this message will bear no fruit in your life. Just like I could sit up here till I'm blue in the face telling you to eat this and avoid that and work out this way. And if you do this, you'll lose a bunch of weight. If you don't put any of it into practice, it's intellectual knowledge at best that does you no good. It benefits you in no way. But if you take whatever problem or problems are in your life right now, and you start to seek God and his righteousness and his kingdom and you lay it out before him, then I promise you, he'll take care of you. I can't say that if you seek him today, that need will be met tomorrow. I don't know. But I know that God's good and that his timing is always perfect, even if it's not our timing. And that if we'll say, God, I trust you enough I trust you enough to at least try what that guy on the stage said. I'm here and I wanna believe that you're real, but I don't know, would you help me? God wants you to know he's real and he wants you to know he's good and he wants to heal you. And one beautiful way he does it is when we start to seek him, seeing his provision in the physical world will build us up spiritually in such a way that we have legs to stand on, spiritually speaking. That when those doubts arise or problems come up, we know this is just another way God can show me that he's real and that he's good. Like the biggest problems in our life are nothing to God. And so I pray 
that you'll begin to trust him enough to seek him and watch him truly provide for you. Not feeling like you, go out, you have to go out and work for it yourself, but that he'll provide.